Uh, yeah, well, right. <laughs> the right one. I'm ready whenever you say it. Sure. <laughs> Hi, welcome to this week's graphics programming virtual meetup. We are going to be following the Berlin, Berlin Code of Conduct. Uh, we have Twitter, you should follow it. Uh, and we have a Discord, which I don't have. Oh, I skipped over. Um, there we go. So this week we're going to be covering shaders, which is pretty damn cool, in my opinion. But last week we didn't have a meeting, so we would have covered cameras and perspective and projection matrices. What am I saying? Um, I'm not reading the slides. Yeah, here's the links to the, the stuff, as in the previous chapters. So this week, we're not covering cameras because we were going to do it last week and we didn't have a meeting and it actually is not that interesting and also isn't very well explained in the tutorial. So I have no qualms with saying look elsewhere for it. But the gist is you have a vertex and model space, which is just relative to the model and you want to turn it into screen space, which is relative to the, the, the screen, you know, the, the pixels on the monitor. And you do it using matrix multiplication. And that's all you need to do. Well, you first have to construct those matrices. And how you construct those matrices is a bit more involved. But explaining how to do all that is actually a lot more nuance, uh, at least from an introductory perspective. And instead of explaining it poorly, I'm just not going to explain it at all. It's, it's, it's honesty, that's what I say. So instead, we're going to be covering shaders. I looked it up on Wikipedia, and a sh Wikipedia says a shader is a computer program originally used for shading 3D seasons. It's a, it's a bit tautological, but anyways, it really is just code. It's code that shades stuff that, you know, colors in the pixels, how you describe it. In our worldview, there are really just two kinds of shaders. There's vertex and there's fragment. Vertex shaders operate on vertices, and fragment shaders operate on fragments, which are pixels, in other words. Um, because a shader is just code, we want to be able to have that code be easily usable or reusable, so to speak. So we define a struct containing virtual methods that you can over that you can derive from and then overload so that we can get some very nice, um, very succinct polymorphism in our code base. So what is a fragment shader? It operates on the vertices. It takes some vertex input and gives us some numeric output that describes the actual position uh, that we want to care about. And that's just so that the rasterizer can actually figure out where those tr points of the triangle should be. But the other point of a vertex shader is preparing data for the fragment shader, which happens later on. Um, as we can see, here's the, if this code here is the definition or the prototype for the vertex shader, you'll see here that this is the act an actual implementation of it. So we have this code that does varying which is related to setting up data for the fragment shader. And then this code, the GL vertex, is getting data from the model. And then here we're doing all that matrix multiplication that we didn't talk about in the last chapter because we skipped last the chapter pretty much. Um, that gets us our coordinate in screen space. And that's what's returned by the vertex shader. So the fragment shader, its job is to figure out how what color to use. Also, we will use it to do things like discarding if we wanted to selectively say, hey, these pixels should be on and those pixels should be off. That's how we can also, well, this is where we would do that. These, the fragment shader and the vertex shader are classic parts of the graphics pipeline. If you've ever seen any open, actual OpenGL text, you'd see some mention to this graphics pipeline where you, you start with a vertex data and you go through all these stages and you, you at the end you get a frame buffer. Well, the vertex shader and the fragment shader are two parts of it. And I'm going to quickly describe the other parts of it and that, well, is really just to illustrate 
where those parts are in our code base. And so the primitive processing is the step that takes the model and turn and gets the actual vertex data out of it. It, it is the, the double for loop that iterates over all of the triangles in our OBJ model and gets each vertex individually and then puts that into the vertex shader. Primitive assembly is what takes the, what's the output of the vertex shader and turns it into something we can rasterize, either a point, a line, or a triangle, except we don't render points or lines, so we don't need to do any really assembly here. We already have it assembled. It's a triangle, and we don't care to do anything else. We could add it in the future, but it's not of a high importance. So the rasterizer is what we've been working on pretty much this entire time, where we have three points and we want to figure out what colors to use and everything um, or what where those positions are and then what colors to use for them so the rasterizer itself is just the function that figures out which pixels to that which pixels need to be drawn not what to draw in them that'd be the step of the fragment shader which is next but after the fragment shader you have pixels as your output except you may not always want to put those pixels in the frame buffer directly. What we're doing right now is just to comp immediately dump them into the frame buffer. And for a lot of use cases, that's exactly what we need. Sometimes we want to remove those pixels for whatever reason. So for like depth, <laughs> for depth testing, we, uh, you know, where we were going to remove pixels that are behind other pixels in the scene, we would want to cull them out. And that's what would happen after the fragment shader. Similarly, there's a thing called a stencil buffer. It's pretty cool. Uh, we're not going to talk about it because we don't implement it here. But another thing we don't cover here is, or in this chapter, is what color blending is and where it's useful. In our opaque only world, where all triangles are completely solid and we can't see through them, you know, um, it's useless because there's no blending going on. There's just triangles being drawn on top of each other. But if you had triangles that are transparent, you'd want to be able to blend the mother in together. And that's really nice to have, especially for things like trees and grass and water, you know, things that make the world look nice. So the only thing in this diagram that doesn't have a modern analog in any form is dithering. And that's not because dithering doesn't exist in some sense in some world it's because it's not a part of the graphics pipeline what goes into the frame buffer is just the pixel data um, so the reason you'd want to do dithering is if you had a very limited color output space and you needed to have a much higher detail level um, there's there's actually some very technical definitions of what dithering is related to signal processing and I tried to make it as simple as possible. You basically, you have a low, um, a low quality output that where the quality isn't the size, it's how much density of information there is. So you try to make it look a lot more dense by varying the actual values across it. Um, as we can see in this picture, we got the, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, that, that statue, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Uh, David? That feels right. But it's dithered so that the lighter areas it's are lighter because they just lack the pixels, whereas in the darker areas are darker because they have the black pixels there. But the actual image only has, I think, three values, or maybe four. Black, dark gray, light gray, and white. But it looks mm -hmm. a lot more realistic. Isn't yeah, it looks like it's like transparency before. It probably is, but I've again, seen, so, we're not doing yeah. transparency here, so. <laughs> yeah. Just you see, like really early fake transparency, I think. Oh yeah. Oh, it was yeah. in um, PS One era or PS Two, I believe. I have some interesting input on this one because uh, I've actually been doing a project uh, that does some dithering oh. in different color spaces. Go ahead. Um, um, so this is like a, just a, like a binary thing, right? So black and white. And then this is like Floyd Steinberg type, uh, where it, um, there's no ordered pattern to it. Right. It's, it's actually a, it, 
Um, there's a sequential dependence here where you've got to start with one pixel and kind of diffuse the error out. Um, so it doesn't work super well in a shader type of context. <coughs> but um, so what I would, uh, I'll send you guys a link here. Um, the, uh, the way I'm doing it, so I've got a, like a compute shader that does ray marching and then writes the result to an image. And um, then there's a, a second compute shader that takes that image as input and writes to another image. Um, basically the process there is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, um, in audio there's an effect that they call bit crushing, uh, which basically just reduces the precision by um, zeroing out the low bits. Um, so what I'm doing here is um, using, uh, it's called ordered dithering. Um, so basically there's a, <coughs> um, this four by four, um, it's not a, it's not a matrix, but it's, um, so it, it's, well, the, the math is not super complicated, but it's basically you, you've got this set of numbers and then you look at the low bits and if the low bits are higher or lower than the accord, like the, the relative number in that uh, order dithering matrix, um, the um, you either go up one or down one um, in, in terms of value. So you see those kind of like uh, cross hatching type artifacts in there. Is that blue noise or is that a blue noise pattern, the dithering pattern here? If you look at it, it's kind of interesting. No, it's, it's not. It's like a, it's not um, blue noise, but it's like it's like the same size jump, almost. It's it's weird. There's an interesting pattern to it. Um, there is a another a tangent to tangent. The game Obra, Return of the Oberdin has a one bit color space. Where everything's black or white or dark blue or a teal color. I mean, it uses dithering as its only way of drawing graphics, and it looks That's great. Me. Um, making it happen in real time was very difficult and took a lot of experimentation. So I'm, I'm actually, I've read the dev blog about it and it's very in detail and I highly recommend it. Um, I'll link it in a minute when I can cool. go and find it. Um, but it, it was the, when you move the camera, it just, there was a problems with swimming and making it coherent looking. Um, and they, he found some very interesting solutions to making it look smooth. Um, but uh, cool. what I was going to end with the dithering discussion is that computer monitors often have dithering built into them. Um, and so you might be sending an 8-bit, a 10-bit signal, but it'd be dithered onto an 8-bit or a 6-bit panel. Um, and that, that's the, one of the ways they cheat and get away with lower quality panels, but not make it look as bad as an actual six bit panel would be. Um, um, or eight bit panel with a 10 bit signal. Yeah. But the point is, is dithering is a specific thing. It's not a general part of the GPU pipeline, at least on modern right. graphics accelerated GPUs, graphically accelerated hardware. Anyways, there's still um, there's still enums in OpenGL for like enable GL dither, but it doesn't do anything. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, it's I don't know. I, I was screwing around with that one point uh, to try and see if I could do it, but it it literally does nothing. So. <laughs> well, um, to get back a little more back on topic, uh, sure, yeah. and to try to blaze through the slides because I can I can babble on, so I need to focus. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention one other thing. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. No, I, I'll, I'll wait till after. Okay. Um, so now that we know what a shader is and our pipeline is, we can actually kind of look at some of the code. We have a Garoud? Gar Garoud? I, I never learned how to say that. But it's per vertex lighting. And it's very, very basic. And the structure of the shader is such that when you write, when you run the vertex shader, if it writes the vertices um, normal, 
to a common storage. So every, when you run all three vertex shaders, the first one writes to the first part in that storage, the second one writes to the second one, third one writes to the third one, and that then is used in the fragment shader. Um, that's what this line is doing, and it's doing it based on what the vertex number is, and that's explicitly passed in uh, by the calling code. Then we have to figure out the position and return that. In the fragment shader, we take the intensity and bar is the very centric coordinates, and then we can simply figure out how intense that pixel should be by interpolating across the surface. And then, so we take white and we multiply it. So we're, this is going to be a grow shading that's from black to white. Uh, I think the picture for that is here. This is what it looks like instead of talking more about code. So the code that calls this is more or less just this. There's a little bit of global setup, which in your own code, you could make it not global, which would be nice. But regardless, we need to set up an image to render to, we need a depth buffer to render our depth values to, um, and alternatively write it out for debugging. So we create a shader, and because our shader doesn't have any, it doesn't have any uh, input data, it just has intermediates, which is what this varying keyword keyword in, implies. We go through the models, all the faces. This would be our, and then all of the vertices in it. So that'd be our primitive, um, not assembly. What well, was the step before the fragment shader? Um, you call the vertex shader for each vertex. And now that you've gone through it, we would have filled in the varying intensity values, and then we can call the triangle on it, which is our more or less our function from before, but modify to call the fragment shader. So this is our triangle function. Um, there's a lot of code. We get the bounding box. Uh, we go through this bounding box, and then we, for each pixel in the bounding box, we figure out the very central coordinates. If the coordinates outside of it um, or behind it, uh, behind the depth buffer, we um, we continue and skip the pixel, doing nothing. Uh, else, we use the very central coordinates to figure out all the values we need that we pass into the fragment shader here, and we get the discard value, which is simply a true or false to indicate whether the fra the results of the fragment shader's computation should be ignored. Um, uh, what was I found confusing was that color is taken by reference, so it's just magically populated. Um, and once you have that value, you can set it into the output color. And combining all those things together, plus the couple of other functions being called, uh, like very centric, we get our model, and it looks kind of plasticky. But we're going to be building on it, making it look better. So. Shaders are really cool because you can easily change what's rendered without modifying a bunch of code um, in existing functions. Instead, you could create a new shader class that impl uh, overrides the, the, that implements the vertex and shader function. Heck, you could actually subclass the Garode and then just have the vertex shader be the same or shared and only override the fragment. Kind of cool actually um and this this one is really cool since it just creates a stepped pattern so it instead of being um white to black it's using a gold color and having discrete steps that's why shaders are cool because you can do stuff like this really easily um but we're missing textures so we want to re-add them um textures need uv coordinates so that means we need to pass the UV coordinates from the vertices into the fragments because the UV values are interpolated across the surface. So we get the UV coordinates at each vertice, and then on our fragment shader, we will multiply them by the very centric coordinates to get the interpolated value across the surface. Um, then we use that for sampling into our diffuse texture map, and voila, textures again. Um, yeah, this, this max is just to make sure we're clipping between zero and infinity instead of having negative values. 
there's there's a couple of places where max and min is used and it's a bit like oh man there's stuff there to think about but it's mainly just to keep things well bounded uh normal mapping normal mapping is a continuation of the idea of texture mapping but instead of applying it to colors we apply it to the normals eeg the normal at it on a surface um currently our normals are interpolated across the surface so if we have a smooth dome would have normals that are smooth but a lot of times there's surface details that are much smaller than the vertices and instead of having to render all of those vertices um, to define the shape of a surface we abstract it by recording all of the fine details into a texture and then sample those across the surface rather than smoothly um, the math for it's a little bit a little bit tricky, but for the purposes here, it's mainly just um, sampling from a texture and then using that value instead of the, the normal that is the interpolated value. Now, where it's tricky is this thing here, this inverse transpose. And it's not going to be covered in this chapter. There's a second chapter, 6b, that does talk about why that's tricky and what's going on in behind the scenes. And so that way we can get the, uh, so we'll cover that when we get there. And instead we're going to set up the shader so that it samples the normal across the surface that's sampled from the texture, making a nice bumpy surface. If we look at the texture here, you can notice that there is a kind of a scar across the cheek. And in this model, you can barely make it out in the texture itself, but if we add normal mapping, the, the scar is very visibly present. Um, yeah, there wasn't anything else I wanted to stop there. One final thing that we can do with shaders is adding specular highlights. There, the shader where this implements is based on Fong's, the Fong model, which is not very accurate, but it is a lot, it's very fast and is, it's very common. In fact, the OpenGL 1 and 2 pipelines are explicitly the, the Fong model. So they have, a, if you're trying to re implement OpenGL 2 or 1, you have to implement Fong shading. But what we're current, what we currently have is this diffuse thing over here in the middle. What we're wanting to add is the specular. This ambient is just simply a base level brightness value that doesn't exist in real life because not things do not glow naturally on their own. They have to have heat, but it's neither here nor there. The model for it, the Fong model, is summed up very nicely in this diagram where we have the normal of the surface, we have the view angle of the eye, we have the L value, which is the light source, we have the R value, which is where the light would bounce off if the light with the surface was really shiny because it's, it's the reflected. You can notice that they're complete opposites. And then we have the H value, which is the halfway point between the view and the light. Um, I'm not going to detail the super strong specifics of how the model is formulated. The math sums up pretty simply, though, in that the diffuse term is just dependent on the surface normal and the light direction so that no matter which angle you view the surface from the diffuse value is always the same you compute it by just taking this cosine between the or the angle between the normal and the light the specular is a bit special because it's based off the viewing angle and the light source so depending on where the camera is um, it will make a difference to whether how, how shiny that surface is at a point. Um, to do that, we actually compute the cosine between the reflectance angle and the viewing angle because the reflectance angle is where the light bouncing off a surface would be the strongest. And if the viewing angle and the reflectance angle are the same, that means you're basically getting the full, full light. And the further you go away from it, the less bright it gets until you know if you're 180 degrees opposite you get nothing but the other aspect is that the shininess falls off really quickly 
so at, if you're viewing things you know at parallel you know the, the reflecting angle and the viewing angle is going to be a really bright bounce but if you're viewing things even at a shallow angle it's going to be significantly less than if it was a perfectly linear trans transition so to model that we're going to use the power function where we raise the um raise the difference of the angle because the the angle is is it the difference um i'm trying to figure out the words to express it basically be the dot product yeah the dot product the value of the dot product is going to be one or less than or equal to one where one would be where they're parallel and less than one is <laughs> decreasing and so if we take a power if we take a number between zero and one and raise it to a certain power it's always going to be smaller so it, it makes it fall off faster i mean i was just explaining what the code does right here where we take the power between the r value what we first make sure it's positive and then we take it to the, the specular as the component we get from the normal map so if our specular component is one we're not going to raise it to the power at all and it's just going to pass straight through but if we have our power say at 10 in the the texture then that area is we're going to raise you know 0 0.5 if our angles are 90 degrees it should be 0 0.5 and if we raise 0 0.5 to the 10th power that's like 0 0.0005 something very strong and we add that and we get nice shiny reflections and uh, you can really see on the his forehead the nose cheek and the collarbone are really shiny that's everything so thank you